Then shall many, someone say many, and then shall many be offended, and that many continues on, shall betray one another, shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, but he that shall endure to the end the same, that one, in other words, shall be saved. So one of the signs, they had asked Jesus, what are the signs of your coming? So he was telling them one of the signs of the end time is massive offense. Can you believe that? Massive offense. What did I tell you last, last Wednesday? America, Americans are easily offended. Why? Because a prevailing spirit is in the land. And what did I tell you? It's connected to this end time revival to the point that when churches decide as individual churches and it spreads to, to counties and to states and denominations and on and on, however, maybe not even in that order, but people start making up their mind, we're not going to be victims of this anymore. We're going to get, the right, we're going to get this right side up then that's when we're going to start seeing revival come and we're going to start getting a move of God because we're going to start overcoming the spirit of offense. And then let's look. Who are the offended? We find the answer to the question, who are the offended? And by the way, if you don't realize, I, I don't have time to go into it tonight because we would be here all night just on that one point. I think we know by looking around us that we are in the end times. I think there have never been such prophetic fulfillment in the church and in Israel and just in the earth itself that we can confidently say, that we're living in the end times. So who are these offended? As we continue, it says, And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Because that abounds, love will grow cold. Now there's two, there's several words for Greek, Greek and Hebrew words in the Bible for the word love. But there's two words that are primarily used for the word love. And one is phileo. And that is interpreted, the definition of phileo is love that is conditional our love from one friend to another, the friend, friends, the love of friends. In other words, you scratch my back, I scratch your back. As long as you keep treating me right, I keep treating you right. As long as you love me, I love you back. And then agape love, the love that is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, that is unconditional. The kind of love that God puts in us. We don't have the ability to love like that. That is a divine thing. That is put in us by, us by divine nature. But gives us the ability, although it may be hard, to love even if we are not loved back. To love even if when we love, we are received with anger. It is possible. Jesus, and we're going to see this further as we go, said love our enemies. 
So, um, who is he referring to when he says, many shall be offended? The many refers to the Christians whose love has grown cold. The people whose love has grown cold are individuals who don't have agape love. Because the love that is not conditional is not based on performance. And it's not based on condition. See, we all need to develop. This is a very, very important statement I'm about to make. I will sit here right now and I will confess to you that I am in this point and I need to, this needs to increase in me as well. I need to grow as well in this area. We all, <clears throat> we all need to grow. We all need to grow in the development of faith in the love of God. That's why I put that. I wrote these notes. We all, thankfully, Miss Linda helped me put them on PowerPoint, but I wrote them and sent them to her. That's why I said we all. That means me too. We all, and I didn't, it's no accident that I said develop. We need to develop faith. In the love of God. What do you mean by that? We need to trust the love of God. Because the next statement shows us that we need to sow into the spirit. Because the Bible says in Galatians 6, 8 through 9, He who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. See, when, but he that sows... To the flesh, will of the flesh reap corruption. Be not weary in while doing good, for in due season you will reap if you don't lose heart. See, if we would ever realize that if we will sow to the love of God, you will reap the love of God. If you will sow spiritual love, love people because they deserve to be loved. That means prostitutes that walk in here. That means if a person walked in here naked, grab a robe and throw it around them and sit them down on the pew and tell them Jesus loves you. We're going to cover you up, but Jesus loves you. Praise God. We don't judge you. We're not here for that. Jesus loves you. It don't matter what state or condition a person is in, whether they got a lot of money or a little money. We don't love you more because you have a degree or don't have a degree. We're not better or less because of who we are or what we have. Yeah. And we, are, we don't base our judgment upon you by how you treat us. If there's anything that the church of the living God needs to learn, it's to get their feelings out of what they're doing in the kingdom of God. This, there's the spirit of offense needs to be broke. It needs to be broke off of this church. It needs to be broke off of this area. It needs to be broke off of the church of the living God as a whole. Get your feelings out of it. It's not about you and it's not about me. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. 
my Lord. Quitting up, getting upset because people say this and people say that. They going to keep saying stuff. People are going to keep saying stuff. Did so your seeds in the love of God. Love them in the spiritual manner. Look, Jesus said, in my greatest hour of need, my closest friends deserted me. How would you like that? Don't you at least have somebody you can pick up the phone and call and talk to when you're really down? Judas betrayed me. Peter denied me. I'm talking about betrayed him to the point that they come and look for him to kill him. Peter denied that he knew him, and the rest fled, and only John followed him from a distance. He's going to see what happened in case, you know, after they got him, then he would. <laughs> and they didn't ask for forgiveness, and yet he gave it. Do you know we didn't even know we needed, we didn't even know to ask forgiveness. That's how ignorantly lost we were. We didn't even know to ask forgiveness. That's how trapped we were in sin. I look out there and I see people that are so trapped in sin that they don't even know that they need to ask Jesus to forgive them of their sins. What are we supposed to do? Judge them? You're lost. You're on your way to hell? No. Be like Jesus, love them. Take them fishing. Just get in there with them and be a friend and show them just everyday love. And then another reason why we get so offended is we have too many, I should point four, we have too high of expectations. Our expectations are too high. We love people expecting them to love us back. We do things for people expecting them to say thank you. I've been guilty myself. I have been guilty since I have been pastoring this church of helping individuals, not people around here, but people that we know. <laughs> I'm looking at you two. <laughs> I'm not going to say who. Yeah. Look, I have helped people. And I looked at my wife and said, they didn't even act like they were. They didn't really even act grateful. They didn't even say thank you. Granted, they ought to, they ought to be, th they should say thankful, they, that they're thankful. But should I measure my appreciation of them as a person or my love for them? Should I love them any less because they don't say thank, thank you? No. I don't have the right to do that because I'm a person just like them. I'm on their same level. I'm no better than they are. Okay, let's move on. Just have low expectations. Expect nothing. If you expect nothing. Jesus came expecting nothing. He came to give. He taught them after he taught. Then he taught them to expect from him. Then he expected. Now. Point five, walls. Because Proverbs 18, 19 says, A brother offended is harder to win than a strong city, and contentions are like the bars of a castle. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. And contentions are like the bars of a castle. 
when there's contention to get through that, it's like medieval warriors trying to break through a strong castle. A brother, a brother. There we go back to that again. See, that's the, that's the brothers and the sisters. That's the kingdom. A brother offended. To win him back. Okay, so. The walls. Were for so-called. Assurance and protection, but I put a question mark. In, the, in those times, all of the entrants that came in and out of those cities were screened. The walls around those cities kept all unwelcome inhabitants and invaders out. Those who were considered a threat to the city's health or safety were kept out. No one was allowed in the city who owed debts until all the debts or taxes were paid. And in much the same way in our lives, when we are hurt and when we are offended, It starts out when we're young, even as kids. We start learning not to trust. As little kids, we just trust easily. We trust. We trust people. We trust our parents, and we trust people. And slowly but surely, we start putting up walls. And then, you know, as we grow up, people hurt us. And we start putting walls, walls. We enter into adolescence. Kids at schools hurt us. Then we get into college, people hurt us. We get into marriage, people hurt us. Walls start going up. And these walls are to safeguard our hearts, to protect us, to keep us from getting hurt further. We become selective and we deny entry. No, I'm not going to hear this. No, I'm not going to let you in. No, I'm not going to hear what he's saying. And there are some things we need to keep out of our lives, rightly so. But when we are keeping things out that we fear, will hurt us. What happens is we start keeping things out and letting offended people in. We don't know how to guard it because it all gets distorted it all gets off and the walls become prisons and we get caught in prisons and the people that we think we only let people in that are on our side, and we, we're selective, and so we, we, we don't let anyone in who think, we think will hurt us, and we filter out those who we think owe us anything, and we don't let them in until they pay us back, until we've punished them to the point that they need to be punished, or until they've paid their debt. But what we realize is we're not only cautious about who comes in, we are no longer venturing 
outside. And we become self-seeking. And our focus is all about self. It's all about self-protection. It's all about self-containment. And it's like, is it the river of Jordan that runs into the Dead Sea? Or the Red Sea runs into the Dead Sea, don't it? Anyway, one of them has energy and living water, but the Dead Sea has no energy. And the red, when the Red Sea, or whichever one, I wish I would, Jordan, when the Jordan has living water and living organisms and life, but when it runs into the, it has an inflow and an outflow. So it's alive. But the Dead Sea has an inflow, but no outflow. So everything that is alive, when it comes in, dies. That's what's going to happen to everybody that's offended, that has walls up. You're a victim of your own self because hurt people become self-seeking without realizing it, without realizing it. But unconditional love gives people the right to hurt you. Having said that, let me say this. You have to get well before you're in the... You got to get healed. Because here's what happens. Before you get to that place, point seven, walls equal strongholds. I talked about this once before, if you remember. Walls equal strongholds. And 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God. Now this is talking about our mind. This is not talking about the enemy, the devil. For the weapons of our warfare, the, what are we fighting? Our mind are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds in our mind, casting down arguments of our mind, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So these walls... Slash strongholds create, listen to this, set patterns of reasoning. And all the information that comes in is processed through a set pattern that you've already got set up. And that set pattern of reasoning, if you're not careful because of your offense, can be a source of torment and it can be a source of war against the knowledge or the knowing of God. What you know God's word says, your own mind can fight it. In other words, your mind will be telling you one thing while the word of God tells you something else. And everything that comes into your life you will filter it through your past hurts and your past rejections and your past experiences and failure after failure and mistake after mistake will continue and continue and continue and continue to come. I pray and I'm, I'm past my time today so I'm going to stop here if you look at the progression 
it goes on down. It, it I got I got further. I got more. Uh, I'm only at point seven. Point A tell eight is that people that are offended go on into knowledge and learning with their offense. And knowledge without the love of God will lead to deception. And then that opens the door for false prophets. Who are false prophets? False prophets are those who have the inward nature of a wolf. What's the inward nature of a wolf? One who will infiltrate and deceive the body of Christ. These people will tell people what they want to hear and not what they need to hear. Because these people don't want sound doctrine. They just want someone to tickle. Do you know how many times that I've wanted to just get up here and preach something that makes everybody happy? You know how many times I'm tempted to get up here because I know how to do it because I, I'm smart enough to know what people want in this hour because I feel it and sense it and see it. I see large and mega churches all over the place doing this and I know what they teach. I hear it and I see it and I hear it and I see it. But he said the, 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 the false teachers were many. It's not that everybody that has a large church is a false teacher. Don't get me wrong. I'm not one of them kind of preachers and people that believes that. I don't, I'm not that way about it. Matter of fact, I don't judge. You know, I'm not anybody. I'm not saying anybody's a wolf. I don't know who, who, who he is. I do know that when all you're doing is tickling ears and nobody's becoming in the image of Christ... Because what we don't want to hear, the message that the flesh don't want to hear, is that I need to be willing to lay down my life. Amen. That's what Jesus said, greater love to surrender to give up myself to give up my life to lay it down so don't be in that group don't let offense don't let it be a part of your life it, it's a strong strong spirit and I pray every I pray every day, I pray every week, I pray against the falling away, I pray against the spirit that, that is causing people to come to church less than they ever have before. People come to church, people are coming to church less and less and less. Why? Why? Why are they doing that? Why are we doing that? Is that okay? Is, is that God's will? Is that God's plan to do that? Huh? Really? Think about it. That's not okay with God. That's not God's, that's not God's plan. It, but preachers are actually facilitating this and making it okay and making it easy. It's not okay, folks. I might be the idiot that everybody points their finger at and thumbs their nose at, but I'm going to be the one standing on the side of the road saying, hmm. Better not be caught in that group. We better do what the Word of God says in this hour. We better change. We better let the Word of the Lord change us. Let's stand. Let's be changed. I'm going to keep loving you. I don't care if you... I don't care. I'm not going to judge you. But when I get in this pulpit, I'm going to preach the truth to you. and tell you what it takes to be saved. Amen.